Good morning, and thank you for joining our final veterans webinar in our summer long series for the year. I'm Patrick Rodriguez, and I work at the U.S. Small Business Administration in the economic development, as an economic development specialist and veteran outreach coordinator in the Los Angeles District Office. I'm also a veteran of Kosovo and Iraq. First, I'd like to quickly go over the AT&T webinar controls at the top of your AT&T window. On the top left, you'll see a raise hand icon, a send note icon, a step out icon, followed by a whiteboard icon. If you want to ask a question, please send a note to me, Patrick Rodriguez, host, or raise your hand, and I'll either ask the question to Jack, or I can unmute your individual phone so you can personally ask a question. Secondly, under the whiteboard icon, if you cannot see the slide at full size, please select the Fit Shared Application to Whiteboard. That's under the whiteboard icon. And at the end, or during, and during the presentation, please feel free to type out any questions and send them to me, the host, and I'll cover them during the Q&A period near the end of the interview. Co-hosting the event is Noah Harris, Director of the Veteran Business Outreach Center. Noah, let's see if Noah is on. Noah is going to join us in just a little bit. Uh, Noah is a director there in Sacramento, and his mission is to serve uh, veteran business owners as your force multiplier, providing business education, mentorship, and funding support. Now, before we officially introduce Jack, our special guest speaker, I want to share just a bit of what the SBA does across the country and what the Los Angeles SBA District Office does here in Southern California for aspiring and existing veteran business owners. The Los Angeles District Office oversees the largest SBA lending market in the country. Sir, we cover 129 cities within Los Angeles, Ventura, and Santa Barbara counties. The office manages a loan portfolio that finances more than 4,900 businesses for $3 billion, more than any other office in the country, and generated annual contract opportunities of $1.97 billion over the last two years. In addition, the district office offers a 8A business development program for socially and economically disadvantaged business owners and oversees a network of eight small business development centers, three chapters of SCORE, and four women's business centers, all of which can assist individuals start, build, and grow their business through technical assistance and financing. And although their names are different, they are all under the SBA umbrella. These resource partners and their advisors are our boots on the ground and provide useful and tangible business advice when and where you need it. When it comes to the general public contacting the SBA for assistance, more likely than not, clients will be directed to one of these business resource centers that are close to where you live and work. If you visit our SBA website, sba.gov, and enter your zip code, you'll find the closest SBA district office and resource partner in your community. Now, uh, today's webinar is our last for this year's veteran webinar series, and we're honored to have with us Jack Nadell, a decorated World War II veteran, international entrepreneur, and award-winning author. So uh, he's asked me to call him Jack, and uh, so Jack, you've been insisting that you're going to retire, so we're lucky to have you here today as our speaker, and we're, we're privileged and honored to have you. Well, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here with you, uh, Patrick, and I think I think we're going to have a lot of fun this uh, next hour. Oh, I think so too, definitely. So, so let's let's get right into it. Um, we have some slides set up that kind of will lead the conversation a little bit, and uh, and I know that you have amazing stories to tell. So, I'll I'll let you take the lead here in uh, in the presentation. Oh, okay. You mean all, all points on the screen? Uh, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's start off with uh, let's start off with the first question. Let's let's tell us more about your military background and how and when you got started as an entrepreneur. Okay, my military background goes back to uh, uh, 1942. I enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Corps uh, immediately after my 19th birthday, and I went through radio training and. Uh, then went into the aviation cadet program, became a navigator, and then a radar officer. And I flew 27 missions over Japan in the B-29. Uh, so, uh, and and how did that how did that experience help shape you and uh, your life thereafter? 
I think it had a, a really lasting effect on me. Uh, first, first of all, I think uh, something that we can't underestimate, and that's the value of discipline. When you're in the service and you have a mission to perform, you have to be disciplined. And when you're in the commercial world and you're trying to make a buck, you also have a mission to perform. And uh, the discipline uh, is is really one of the major factors, creativity, discipline. And the one place it differs with the service is you, it's up to you to decide what your direction is and at what point you need to change it. And and when you got when we were done with your final mission and you're headed back home, what was on your mind? Uh, what were you thinking about that at that time? Well, I had no idea that it was my final mission. Finally, after 27, and when I first came over, they said at the end of 20, uh, you, you, your tour is through. But uh, we lost too many uh, B-29s. And uh, at, at, after the 27th mission, they sent me on rest and recu recuperation to uh, harbor, to Pearl Harbor, to, to Hawaii. Hi. And uh, and uh, I arrived there on August 4th. I don't know why these dates stick in my mind. Uh, of 1945, and the war, and it was a 10-day leave, and the war ended on August 14th. So an hour before I was about to report back for duty, uh, the war ended, and all orders were changed. So I had no advance notice, uh, just a feeling of intense relief and uh, a lot of emotion. I, I, I couldn't help but think of uh, all my buddies that had been lost and, uh, and the fact that uh, I, was, I, I, I was surviving. And that, that must have been a tremendous motivation uh, when you came back. So what, what did that lead to? When you came back from uh, when you came back stateside, and uh, then you you got uh, your family and your brother involved in one, in, a, in a business endeavor. Is that, is that right? Correct? Well, my brother and I uh, were very close, uh, and uh, uh, as a matter of interest, uh, he was stationed at Pearl Harbor as a Marine on December 7th when the uh, when we were attacked. And I was at Pearl Harbor on August 14th, the day the war ended. So I guess the Nadel brothers bracketed the war. Uh, but we decided to go into business, and uh, uh, we knew we wanted to, uh, to be in business for ourselves. I don't think the word entrepreneur existed at the time. Uh, but the world of opportunity was tremendous. Uh, most of all production had been in military uh, production and a lot of uh, 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 civilian cars weren't being produced and a lot of uh, material that uh, had to wait in line for the war to end and there was uh, there was a lot of opportunity so we went into business immediately we hit the ground running and uh, we, we our first deal was checking in with the LA Ch Chamber of Commerce and they had a very strong foreign trade department and uh, uh, one of the things we picked out immediately that there was a Chinese delegation looking for Navy Blue Willow material. Well, there wasn't any. But we knew just having come out of the service that the uh, that we were selling a lot of surplus on the olive drab and we made arrangements to buy the olive drab, dye it navy, and sell it to the Chinese. That was our first deal. Incidentally, we did it without money or education. Just, uh, just good motivation to to provide for your your families and uh, get the deal done. I assume. Well, I think I think this is one of the primary uh, uh, pieces of advice I give: is you must be motivated. You must know what you want to do. You must push yourself. It's uh, it's not a simple matter. Even at the beginning of this last book I wrote, The Evolution of an Entrepreneur, the first thing I write in the book is that uh, 
you have to be, when you read this book, don't read it as an intellectual pursuit. Get into it. Get the feeling of it. Understand what we're trying to say. And I started off with the, uh, uh, a very simple, what I call method, the Nadell method, mm -hmm. uh, which is in five steps and takes five minutes to read. Awesome. I think we're going to cover that in just a little bit. So let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what um, what a lot of veterans have trouble doing, and that transitioning over from the military to civilian life. And well, yes. That's an interesting transition. Uh, after all, now, now I wasn't a career soldier. I was, a, I was, let's say, a citizen soldier. So uh, I was more than anxious to 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 uh, leave the service, although my experience was invaluable, and I wouldn't I wouldn't sell it for a billion dollars. But the uh, uh, the, the the service, the, the the Army Air Corps, did a lot for me, and one of the things that it did. I think is very useful in in, in the commercial market uh, was to to give me the discipline uh, uh, that to carry out. As I said, uh, the mission was prescribed. But the difference that I learned is that unlike the service, you must learn to reverse course at a moment's notice. That that now the decisions are yours. Uh, when you were in the service. Uh, you got the uniform of the day, the meal of the day, the orders of the day, etc. Uh, as a civilian, you don't work, wake up to that. You you set your own agenda, and it, it's in accordance with your own set of priorities. So uh, I remember the the adage that uh, before you could give orders, you had to learn to take orders, and in in the commercial world, it, it consists of both. It's true. You know, uh, there's there's been a, quite a number of studies now that the the uh, Iraq War and Afghanistan War is, is winding down, and a lot of these veterans are coming back and they're going into higher ed, vocational training, or even starting their own businesses. And a lot of the studies say that veterans um, statistically make better business owners because of those qualities they bring uh, in from the military. And I wanted to ask you, what's your what's your opinion on that? Well, I definitely agree with that. That the that coming in from the military is is excellent training, and uh, how effective it is, or how much it does for you, is dependent on where you're going. Uh, the first thing I recommend, for example, is don't ask me what is the best kind of business to go into at the present time because that keeps changing. Uh, what you should ask is what is it that you like to do and what is it that you qualify to do. And after you've made that determination, uh, then you can start thinking in terms of how you can make a profit at it. So the, 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 the transition is an interesting one because uh, the circumstances become entirely different. You're no longer operating under a set of orders. The orders are the ones that are dictated by your mind, by your family, and by your needs. You know, one thing I, that kind of crossed my mind when you were talking about coming back and, um, you know, the economy had shifted from, from military and it was going back to the civilian sector. And for the service members that have been in been in you know, on duty for the past eight years, you know, this, this recession hit in 2009. They're coming back into a, a different economy than the one they left when they were civilians. And I can see a lot of similarities uh, with, with coming back and uh, trying to integrate into the workforce now uh, like it was back when, uh, when you were in the service. You know, a totally different paradigm of, of work. Uh, but but the principle, Patrick, is that uh, we as individuals cannot watch the financial pages 
and say it's time for this or it's time for that. I think while we've learned, uh, and particularly in this computer age and the age of high technology, is that there's no such thing as one size fits all. Uh, when you're ready is when you should go into business, not when you read some article in the Wall Street Journal that says now is the time to go into business. Because what you may do is completely foreign uh, against what is the current uh, fad. You, you've got to go by by your own needs, but it's one, the one the one big thing that 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 you learn. And one of the uh, not only the veterans but the uh, civilians or whatever background you have, whether you're coming out of college or you're going directly from high school or you dropped out of high school, it's the same thing. The conditions that have changed is that there are very few safety nets out there anymore. You no longer can count on uh, the politicians or the unions or uh, any other element of society to determine what you're worth in the commercial world. And 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 my feeling, and it's just a feeling, and it's, a, it's an opinion, it's not a fact, uh, but that uh, I, we we as individuals are much better off if we depend on ourselves, and that goes right down the line. You, you're going to go into business. Don't expect to go into business and not have any stress. If you're going to if if you can't stand stress, get a job. It I, I mean it doesn't mean the job may not give you stress. Yeah. But uh, you have you have uh, more opportunity to be stressful if you're in your own business and, and you have to meet a payroll and 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 pay the rent and uh, do all the other necessary things. So you've got you've got to you've got to know that that's part of it that you're going to have some stress. But 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 the important element is that you're the person that makes the decision. If you'd been into a deal and, and, and the deal went sour, uh, I'm not interested in what the other guy did to you. The question is, what did you do? What did I do? This, this is how I always, uh, I've, I've been in a dozen different businesses. And and mostly, thank, thankfully, I've been uh, uh, very successful and I've always made a profit. But uh, I've, I've had a few failures too. And at that time, it's not that you get knocked down; it's that you're able to get up, and and say, "What did I do that was wrong? How could I have changed it?" Because I can't change the other guy; I can only change myself. If I don't like somebody's attitude, I'm not going to change it, but I can change my reaction. Sure. And a lot of these, a lot of these points, I think. Uh are covered in in your book as, as well, right? In, in uh, with case studies. Yes, all of the points I I deliberately structured this book, which I I named the evolution of an entrepreneur because I sincerely believe that we all evolve into a position of capability that may not have been there a few years before that, and even at my advanced age, I learn more in the past several years that has equipped me to write this book because I've written seven books on business. Uh, but the, 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 the interesting part is I said, okay, I'm coming out. I'm starting fresh. What do I need? I know I have to know where to go. I say, okay, in my book, uh, the first thing you better do is decide what you want to do. And, and the second thing you better do is to chart your course. How are you going to get there? Well, how 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 are you going to, how are you going to make it happen? So, in each and each uh, statement, now uh, the the third thing was was a method for doing it. So you say, okay, you've told me that. Now what do I do? Well, I try to uh, to put that in, in in the book, and then I I give a a business memoir of some of my more interesting deals and everything I talk about. Is something I have done. This is not something that I've read about or something that somebody else did. This is this is this is what I've done. So there's a certain amount of blood and guts that 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 <laughs> that rides through the whole thing. And I wind it up with my 50 favorite tips, which came out of 
uh, thousands of experiences. So that what you got there is a distilled version of of what I feel is the best way to go into business, that the information that is needed. And before people start asking me questions or or or, or get into details, I really recommend that they read the book and read it the way I recommend it, with a an acceptance to it. In other words, don't go don't go at it cynically and say, okay, that worked for him, but that has nothing to do with me. Right. There's something of value that you can get out of it, and my interest as a as a salesperson, as a uh, projector of ideas, is after our conversation today, Patrick, what did the participants in the webinar get out of it? Not not what I so much what I put into it. And every time I do this, I have experiences that that help me. In your in, in also, uh, you know, a lot of people are, they come out of the military and they're very good at operations. Or, or if you're in the private sector and you've been in sales, you're, you're a really good salesperson. Um, but you may not be good at the back end of running the business. Now, some of, the, some of that um, can be, you know, compensated for by your management team, but when you came out of the service and started your business and or during your your time in business, what were some of your strengths and weaknesses and, and how did you overcome them? Well, my weaknesses, for example, would be uh, in financing, uh, although I had a good feeling for numbers and having been a navigator, I knew how to plot things, but, but the, uh, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have the experience or the knowledge on, on how do you really finance a deal, which uh, contributes to a lot of failures. I didn't have any experience on, on, on going on the line and com make, making commitments and, and going into it without, without fear. Uh, fear of failure is another very uh, tough negative that, that, that one has, that has to get out of his system. And, and the other thing was to get my ego out of it. There's no artistic success in business. Either it works or it doesn't work. Uh, if you're a salesperson and you go out to make a sale, uh, don't tell me how smart you were. Just tell me if you got the sale. One of the other things that uh, that we we like to promote here at the SBA is that you know for veterans there are a lot of, of training opportunities for them, and we're doing a boots to business curriculum now for folks that are in the military and transitioning out of the military. It's a two-day course, uh, and it's a little kind of like a business 101 boot camp. And, and we're very proud of, of putting that together with the DOD. Uh, but a lot of them come out of the military, and they're, they're very, you know, they have lots of ideas, a lot of experience, but not a lot of capital. And and that's one of the things that I'd like for you to kind of talk about and, and how you view that, that situation. Well, I think the basics uh, that you put out are invaluable. And, and, and certainly they'll be of great value to the person coming out. The business of financing and somehow how am I to get the money to do this or, 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 or some people have the feeling that if you don't, it takes money to make money. If you're not wealthy to start with, you can't make it. Well, I swung a million dollar deal without having a thousand dollars in the bank. Uh, the not that I was that great is that you've got to know where to go for help. Uh, no one lives in this world by themselves. I was very fortunate. I hooked on to a bank, the Union Bank, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in 1946, that had a very uh, a very active foreign trade department, and the head of the head of that department actually took me through it, and taught me all about hey, don't you take you take the financial risk out of it if you're performing by the use of letters of credit. Well, most people don't know what letters of credit are, uh, uh, to say nothing of back-to-back -back letters of credit. Where you're guaranteeing your next purchase by the by by 
by the letter of credit, which is guaranteed by a bank. Now, this may sound too involved, but uh, uh, you find you find the best source you can for information. But do not go to somebody who hasn't done it. You've got to go to somebody who's been there. If you want a mentor, get a mentor has been successful in something that's similar to what you're trying to do. Right. Uh, uh, I, I mean, you may like your Aunt Tilly a lot, but she don't know that. <laughs> And, uh, and, the, and the SBA, like I mentioned at the beginning, we have a, we have a network of resource partners, uh, small business development centers, women's business centers, and SCORE. And I think you particularly uh, are underlying SCORE because they are the volunteers of the bunch that have that experience starting businesses, running businesses, being presidents, executive officers of businesses. And they're doing uh, our country a favor, literally, by volunteering their time and experience and mentoring and mentoring those that um, that are looking for assistance through the SBA. Uh, I have a great feeling for SCORE, uh, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, a number of years ago I did volunteer, and I did become an advisor at SCORE, and uh, I think it, that theory is excellent because what they're recruiting, the advisors of SCORE, I forget what the uh, SCORE represents, a uh, small... Uh, it, stand, it, it stands for Service Corps Retired Executives, but they they uh, they did away with the acronym because a lot of them weren't retired yet and they were, they were a little bit frustrated that they were being oh. retired, but okay. they were actually non-retired. Well, you see, the, here, here's the deal. Uh, uh, I, I, I've, I've never, it, it's when I theoretically retired is I didn't stop the activity. Uh, in, in other words, the thing, what I did was what I did not have time for while I was into day-to-day -day operations, I was able to do in, uh, quote, retirement, unquote, which I did at 70. So, uh, uh, people say, well, when are you going to slow down? I said, well, I, I think when, uh, when they plant me. <laughs> because because uh, I can't think of anybody enjoying anything more at my age than what we're doing right now, that I can pass on something of value. It's my legacy. Uh, and, and I found that my, writ my spoken words will, will be forgotten very easily or very quickly and over a period of years, but the written words that I've got down there uh, are going to go on and on, and who knows. And the, the Nadell method that you uh, referred to earlier, that's, that's, uh, that's 70 years in the making, is that right? That's right. That's, that's uh, right. You, would you like to, would you like to uh, cover that a little bit for our, for our participants today? Well, I, let, me, let me just briefly encapsulate it. Uh, the Nadell method is, is, first of all, identify a business idea that you love. Now, I, I, I can't state that too strongly. Not what somebody else likes or what your dad thinks you should go into. What you like, what you love, what you want to do. If you love what you do, you never work, you really don't work a day in your life. After that, you have to ask the right questions and do the research. And I always recommend that you do your own research so you don't get anybody else's inhibitions involved in your decision. Uh, and today it's fantastic because whatever you want to research is available on your search engines, mm -hmm. and I, I, which I use all, all the time. And, I, and, I, and, and uh, uh, it, it's just great where you have to go to the library and check and travel and so on. Hey, you put you, you you tap your computer and boom, you've got it in front of you. But there are a lot of other things to the, the research to tell you who's in the business that you want to get into, uh, how successful they are, what what they're doing, what they're doing that make them successful, and most importantly, what you can do to be uh, a little different and, and a little bit more successful. So you have to then plan your deal. And when you plan your deal, that's the third step, is you've got to focus on the details. Uh, go through it. 
I literally uh, and visualize meeting after meeting where I say something and the other person says something, and then I answer it. And, and when I come in for the actual meeting, it's like I'm going in for the second time and I'm in familiar territory. That's then great. when you've made the deal, and, and uh, I feel very strongly a deal is only good if it's good for everybody involved, then you have to fulfill your agreement. That's the fourth step in the Nadal method. And then I put and try to provide a little something extra. Do more than you than you expected. It'll pay off big dividends because step five is to review the results for the next time because the best the best time to set up your next deal is when you've already uh, uh, succeeded in coming to an agreement on the first one. That briefly is a Nadel method. Good. One of the tips you mentioned in in the book also, you said, it, like you, you just mentioned it a minute ago, a good deal is only good if it's good for everyone. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what that means to you? Well, it means you come away with, I don't want to feel that I made a deal because I'm a faster talker or I, I thought faster or, I, or the deal comes at the expense of the other person. I feel that the best deal is where you put the elements of the deal in it so that everybody benefits. If it's a buyer and seller situation, it's got to work both sides of the uh, uh, of the table. Uh, it's got to be good. Good for. There are many times that I've made deals, believe it or not, where I've set up the deal and I set up the perimeters, and uh, I said, listen. Uh, I think this is a perfectly fair deal. I'll go either end. If you if you want to buy, I'll buy. I'll sell. If you want to sell, I'll buy. Ooh, so okay. nothing could be stronger than that. Uh, so the the the, the so-called morality, or being honest, or trying to improve everybody's position, is not only a, a, gives you a good feeling, but it makes for business that just goes on forever. I mean, I have people call me that I haven't spoken to for 20 years that, that want to make a deal. And it's about the relationship, not the business. It's about relationships. It's the, it's the, it's my, what I call the three R's of business. You know, when you start your education, it's the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic. And in business, the three R's are, uh, 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 first of all, relationships, because everything starts with a relationship. And then it gives you the e-ticket to present your deal. Right. And then and then the result of those relationships, how you made it pay off for you and the other people involved. And then the third thing of the, is the rewards that come back to you automatically. So you've got to... Uh, in my in my business in my business and in my feeling, uh, all business is personal. And another uh, another tip that you talk about is confidence breeds success, and success breeds confidence. And I think that was was uh, alluded to when you talked about in visualizing going into that meeting and presenting, and then when you actually do it, it's like you you you've had. It, uh, and practice at it. So well, let I think me, it's more than just that, though, isn't it? Let, let me use a sports metaphor, uh, Patrick. If, I, uh, if, if I'm learning to play golf and finally I get up and I hit a drive 250 yards down the middle, by the time I get to that ball to hit the second shot, I have all kinds of confidence. My odds of, of, uh, of getting a good shot are, very, uh, are right in my favor. But if I sliced my drive into the woods or uh, uh, topped the ball or did something else, when I come up to that ball again, I'm not as confident. And my confidence is what follows through in my ability to strike the ball. Well, it's the same thing in business. I make a deal. It's, uh, it, it works. Uh, I'm, I'm, I feel good. The other guy feels good. Uh, and and, and, and we, we keep going. Uh, but if if uh, 
if some of it was built was built on a false premise or a false assumption, uh, and the whole thing falls apart, then uh, then it does it doesn't work. So confidence, so success does breed confidence, and confidence does breed success. There's no question about it. Well, point well taken. There's there's also um, you know, the whole book is is based on your evolution and and how you managed to to transition out of the military and and then be a successful entrepreneur for over you know fifty years. So how how did you do that, and how do you recommend other people to evolve with the quickening pace of of uh, you know e-commerce and social media and and all the other uh, you know, international forces that are out there? Well, it doesn't happen all at once, and most of it happens as you, as you confront it. Uh, but I've, I've had some, uh, I have some great relationships with people I have mentored. And uh, the, the one thing I, 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 really, I really say to them, uh, for only one reason, is that in order to, uh, to do it, I, I think that the that they have to read the book. They have to read it. They have to understand it. It's like having a textbook. It's like learning that two plus two is four. <laughs> and here, here's the deal: the rules keep changing. When I when I when I started my company, the model company was IBM. You know, everybody was dressed in a suit and a white shirt and a, a certain width tie and so on. Uh, and when, before me, when you went to business, it might have been uh, General Motors or the railroad where they built whole cities to build their business. Uh, and, and you had to buy from the company store. There's a different set of circumstances. Today, today it, it, it's technology and the uh, the advent of the of the of the computer and uh, great companies like Google and Microsoft, uh, and and the and the weapons that you have are, are unbelievable. Uh, uh, as I've mentioned the internet, but I remember my first deal in China. I had to send a sample to uh, to the Chinese, and it took three weeks for the sample to get there. Well, today it's overnight. Mm -hmm. And if I want to contact a number of people in the same business in Shanghai or in Tokyo or in Paris, all I have to do is uh, is put in the words, and the search engine does it for me. And I see uh, uh, the websites of, uh, of a dozen different companies providing what I want. So the circumstances have changed. It's it's more, but but then the merchandising has to change with it. So you can't you can't solve today's problems with yesterday's answers. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you publish a book or you or you print a newspaper, it's a totally different distribution system. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're broadcasting, if you're on television or radio, you used to have three networks. Now you have uh, a literally dozen, maybe hundreds of sources mm -hmm. of, of of this content. Yep. So you 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 have to understand what's out there. Here's the deal: I could encapsulate it. Uh, if you're a smart, hard-driving individual, and you get your ego out of the picture, uh, you can you can follow the road. The road is set for you. There are plenty of roads. It's just a question of choosing uh, which roads. But you don't have to. Have a machete and go through the jungle. <laughs> right. Good. Good point. You mentioned your work in China, and I know that you were one of the first uh, folks to be asked to go back to Japan and um, help foster better trade relations. But what was that like uh, for you when you were asked by President Reagan to to be a part of that trade mission? How did that affect your business, and how did that? Uh, how was that incorporated into your business philosophy? Well, that was one of the most delightful and and and, and uh, rewarding experiences of my life. Uh, I was already in my 60s when this happened, and we were having a problem uh, with Japan. We just couldn't get American merchandise in there, 
and President uh, Reagan uh, put together a trade mission that consisted of uh, half a dozen entrepreneurs. And he invited uh, me to be part of that mission. And uh, uh, and our job was to was to promote the sale of American merchandise in Japan. Now there were a lot of uh, a lot. Of, I, I learned so much on that one week, and and we were able, most importantly, to set up personal relationships with the Japanese, so that the uh, uh, the meetings were enormously constructive. I remember having lunch with the president of Mitsubishi and Sony, Akira Marita, and 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 I said something like stupid, like, "Here's the huh? deal," and they stopped me. No, somebody else. And Marita said, "Look, you Americans come over. You want to make a deal." Even that young guy that uh, sounded like he's with an agency. I think I've heard his, his voice before. I, uh, hold on one second. Let me take care of the. Um, That's Gil. The uh, audio. Okay, sorry about that, Jack. No problem. So uh, it's it's it it's really uh, it was a lifetime lesson for me. He said, "We Japanese want to establish a relationship, so we know each other, so we trust each other, and we can make many deals from that relationship." So these these. And 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 the Japanese had the position that we should observe their traditions, and they had an antiquated system of produce of of distributing uh, retail merchandise, and uh, we're able to explain on a common level that that's great if if you're if you're an isolated country, but in these days of, uh, of communication and travel. It isn't healthy to have a product, for example, that uh, sells in Tiffany's in Tokyo for $1,000 and Tiffany's in New York for $600. So you, 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 the must, must streamline the, the, the distribution. Not because I say so, because that's what's, that's what's, that's what's happened. That's what's about to happen. We actually were, uh, at that time, the Japan, Japan was, uh, was in, very very strong position was was uh, gaining a lot of ground, but what we did is we eliminated we helped eliminate uh, a lot of barriers. We got to understand each other, and out of that I came up with since my experience with Japan is so terrific because I started off obviously during World War II and and fought and and and, and hated and everything else. And, and uh, uh, over the years, I've learned to respect and and uh, and love the Japanese culture, and 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 the Japanese experience. And uh, uh, they become a wonderful trading partner. And on the grand scale, uh, I, I insist that people who trade don't fight. That's very true. One of the one of the uh, correlations I, I, I can imagine could be, you know, today with uh, China uh, being uh, a rising player on the world stage and economically um, sending goods here to the United States to sell. Um, very similar, I would assume, to uh, Japan uh, when it first uh, emerged as a world player and started exporting. And how would you? recommend uh, these young entrepreneurs that are coming out to, to engage these new partners that are out there uh, participating in our economy? Well, there, there are so many possibilities. Uh, we don't have time to even mention, but they, let me just mention a couple that, that come to mind uh, to begin with. Uh, when I started and through most of my career, we looked at a lot of these countries as sources of supply, and still do. And there's a lot of controversy about the outsourcing of jobs and going. But but the natural flow of events is going to take handmade merchandise to the cheapest labor market. But what we don't realize is some of these markets uh, that we've been just buying, importing from, 
have become wonderful opportunities to export too. So that uh, uh, take China, for example, which is now the second biggest economy in the world and has a billion, 300 million people, uh, what a market there is for American merchandise. You just have to find the pattern to get it in there. Mm -hmm. So you, it goes it goes both ways, I think. But there's universal truths in mathematics and the law of supply and demand and so on is that, uh, for example, uh, at certain points in time, the dollar is cheap. And when the dollar is cheap, that's the time to export. And when the dollar is expensive, that's the time to import. What would you say, and, and I know that you know, the SBA has uh, a couple of uh, SBA programs and uh, training. We have a Center for International Trade Development in Long Beach that specializes in, in um, consulting services related to exporting. And we have three different loan programs uh, for those that are interested in exporting. I mean, the, the technical assistance is out there. The financing is out there. Um, but like you said, the, the motivation to go out there as a small business owner and export may not be there. So how would you persuade a small business to begin exporting a product or service? Well, the problem that you have is both motivation and fear. Fear is of the unknown. And I have had a saying for a long time, uh, think global but start local. Uh, improve your deal first. Sell it in your local community. Uh, and the government and the SBA, and uh, uh, I remember at a certain point in time in the tax structure, you, you had a tax benefit by exporting. Uh, the, the, the reality is that 60 to 70 percent of the market for American merchandise is outside the limits of the United States. So why would we not go after that? And I, I'm a great believer in free trade, but I think I'm in pretty good company. Uh, the two greatest believers of free, uh, free trade in, in, in our presidents was President John F. Kennedy and President Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Different sides of the, of the political poll but they both believed in low tariffs and, um, and eventually eliminating tariffs, encourage foreign trade. That's true. And, uh, and I'm sure you know the, um, the current um, administration's goal uh, is to double our exports in 10 years. And you know, at the SBA, we have a, a very clear goal of helping those small businesses you know, accomplish this. And well, if you want to do that, then you've got to point out, you got to educate and point out the enormous advantages that you have. As I said, in the, we set up an I set up an export company uh, a number of years ago that was strictly handled ex exporting out of the United States because there was a huge tax benefit on on earnings from that. Uh, if you have friendly government, if you, if your government understands what, what, what you're after, and, and we're obviously making the effort uh, with the SBA and with all the, and all the help and all the training and so on, that this is terribly important to, to, to the United States, to the world economy, and to us as individuals for our own, for our own better standard of living. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of veterans come back, you know, they've been overseas, they've seen places that uh, a lot of small business owners haven't, and they do want to do, uh, they do want to get into exporting. And I noticed that, uh, that you're also uh, giving away some of the, uh, your copies to, to veterans. And what, what inspired you to do that, to help them uh, get into exporting, or just in business in general? No, I'll tell you what it was. I think there's, the, the, there's probably no such thing as, as an unselfish act. I, I, I wanted to do something for the veterans because I am a veteran. Uh, I, I, I directly know and understand 
what they are going through. And I know that my book can help them. So through the means of, of well, once more, modern technology, and I'm a, for an old guy, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm probably the oldest living geek in the world. Uh, I, I, I have this, uh, the e-book, uh, which I was very pleased. I got the, uh, uh, like the, the, the award number one for the best uh, uh, foreign e-book for, for global, for global e-book. Uh, and uh, that that was that was very rewarding to me, but but the reason I'm gifting them uh, is that any veteran who wants to read my book and is is a veteran and has is making is sincere sure. about wanting to be in business or is in business, just go to my website, and I have one section that specifically says gift for veterans. Send the information, and you will get back uh, an e-book with my compliments of uh, the evolution of an entrepreneur. I, we appreciate that, and we want to also just kind of you know wrap up a little bit. We still have a little bit more time, but um, if you could give one piece of advice to a, a veteran entrepreneur, what would you tell them? I would uh, I would tell them to uh, first of all uh, be sure they're doing something they love to do. Secondly, uh, if when if 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 they have to go out and seek financing, find some way to prove the deal in a modest way so that the uh, uh, the lender has some basis for, for for lending. In other words, I've had I've had a young man come to me with a yeah. Uh, and with uh, a half a dozen facets of it, uh, and uh, and I said, what have you? Which, which one have you actually performed? Well, not any, but I'm looking for financing. I said, take the one that that you think you can work the fastest with the least amount of money and prove your deal. I'd like to. I, I like. Uh, I'd like to see the deal proven, and then you have no problem with financing. There are billions of dollars out there looking looking for places to go where they know it will work, but they're not willing to invest on theory. So I guess that would be the 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 the, the advice to 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 uh, have so much of that because it all leaps to my mind from the self motivation, but it's it's all there in the book. I I try to I try to encapsulate it. I try to distill. Uh, 70 years of experience into a 300-page book. Uh, that's, a, that's a tall feat right there. Um, and now I want to open it up to... I'm sorry, I think it was 200 pages. <laughs> I want to open it up to questions. I had a couple of people text me during the presentation, but I'd also like to open it up to people that want to ask questions directly to Jack over the phone. Uh, just to start off, one of the questions that was texted was, um, you know, with all the equipment and uh, supplies that weren't weren't used in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, would would you know something similar to what you did, selling uh, OD green uh, uniforms, would that be something that a, a veteran could take advantage of, selling surplus equipment now? Um, Absolutely, and fantastic thinking. Because the first thing I say is to find a need and fill it. Now, if you know that there's a there's a surplus of merchandise or certain valuable pieces of property that that, that are available at at uh, reasonable prices, uh, and you can find a place uh, to put them, to place them, to sell them, absolutely. Whoever asked that question is absolutely on track one. And I mean, I know that um, that uh, GSA, the General Service Administration, covers a lot of that. Uh, the DoD has websites for surplus materials. You can go online and uh. look up. Um, there, there are different government auctions that occur. And I'm sure I'm just covering the tip of the iceberg, but um, we do have a government contracting department uh, here at the Los Angeles office. So if you need more information, you can give us a call or look us up on the web. Uh, our number is 818-552-3201. Thank you. And, uh, we can help you uh, get started in government contracting. Um, it's, a, it's a whole different animal 
But that's uh, a great service that SBA re uh, renders. Re it's 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 yeah. wonderful. Especially if you're a veteran and service disabled veteran, we have uh, special uh, programs for those who are uh, service disabled, and uh, we'll help you with uh, set aside programs. So our, I just want to repeat the phone number again. Somebody asked. It's 818-552-3201, and that's our direct number here at the Los Angeles office. Um, and if you look at the presentation, um, if you don't get to ask a question to Jack today, you can go on his website at jacknadell.com, and you can personally ask him a question under the Ask Jack banner. And uh, you answer those questions and blog about them, don't you? I answer the questions. I blog about them. I, I, I read them all. I, uh, I, I am very interested in, in what's coming from the outside. And, uh, I, and I thank you for mentioning the website, which is jacknadell.com, in which there's a wealth of information, including a number of articles that I have written that have been uh, uh, placed at the Huffington Post, that uh, that that, w that were on Fox News, uh, and, and various other interviews that I've done. Uh, I've uh, I've got the uh, link uh, to those interviews. So if there's something that you like, you may have somebody that you're interested in, in the audience that's really interested in nonprofits, mm -hmm. and in an interview I gave. Uh, with my wife and, and, and the chairman of my one of my favorite philanthropies, uh, it, it was proven that you need a lot of the same skills that you have as an entrepreneur to be effective as a nonprofit. And I just want to reiterate, you can submit questions to Jack on his contact page uh, there on his website. And I also want to um, give uh, a moment to our co-host who was, uh, was in a board meeting this morning but is now uh, in, the, in the webinar. Uh, Noah, are you there? Yes, uh, I am. Thanks, Patrick. I, and I, I know. I apologize for, uh, for having to, to uh, do the introduction at the end instead of the beginning. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say a few words to Jack and also to uh, just tell a little bit, everybody a little bit about what the VBOC does. Sure. So first, I definitely want to acknowledge Jack and uh, appreciate his taking time out of his schedule to share his pearls of experience and wisdom distilled from uh, being, being in the trenches, so to speak, uh, both as a veteran, fellow veteran, and also as an entrepreneur. The Veterans Business Outreach Center is uh, another one of the uh, SBA partially funded programs that specifically works with veterans that are looking to get into business and those who are already in business, essentially to, uh, as it relates to what Jack has been sharing, to embody and put into practice those different principles to bottom line, grow the business, create jobs, and to um, make stronger communities. And we do that through um, through a number of of, of methods, mainly workshops and, and training and one-on-one and -on -one assistance with business owners. But in the interest of time, I, I did want to just really encourage everyone on the line to uh, reach out to your local SBA partner, whether that's uh, the Veterans Business Outreach Center score, uh, the Small Business Development Center. In any case, there are resources and people on the ground where you are to help you, uh, regardless of whether you're just starting with a business idea or if you're already in business to move forward. And um, you can find information about the Veterans Business Outreach Center and the other resource partners by going on the SBA website. There's a resource locator page that lists all of the all of the program partners, and you can simply put in your zip code, and it'll tell you who's the closest partner to you. So. Without any further ado, uh, thank you, Patrick, for the opportunity. Again, I'm sorry I, I was um, unable to join earlier, and I just thank everyone for your service uh, and your attention today with uh, with our esteemed uh, guest, Jack and Patrick. Thank you, Noah. I appreciate it. Thank you.
So Jack, with uh, with just a couple of minutes remaining, I just wanted to to say uh, you know, thank you. It's been an honor having you on on our webinar series, and uh, hopefully next summer when we kick it off, uh, you can be a part of that as well. We'd love to have you back and, and share some some of your words of wisdom on how how your how your future books coming along, and uh, if that's in the works or not. But I'm sure you'll still be um, working on, on something. Well, I certainly will be because uh, at this point, you know, let me let me compare it to, 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 to sports again. In football, you have three, four quarters. The first quarter, you learn. The second and third quarter, you do it. <laughs> and the fourth quarter, I think you should be teaching it. Well, I'm in the two-minute drill, so I'm, I'm teaching as much <laughs> as I can. Well, we really appreciate your time and uh, your wisdom this morning, and um, uh, hopefully we'll have you back next summer. I'll look forward to it. Thank I you, just, Patrick. Thank you, Jack. I just want to close out by saying um, that, uh, that that one, the resource partners uh, that we have on board, like VBOC and our other uh, small business development centers, women's business centers, and SCORE, uh, they're, like I said, our boots on the ground and provide useful and tangible business advice when and where you need it. Uh, I want to thank all the participants on the webinar today for those who participated and also for those who participated in our past webinars. Uh, it's a wonderful finale for this summer, and I look forward to hosting the series again next summer. And I just want to reiterate SBA's and VBOC's strong support of the service members who are serving all around the world and, and uh, for the veterans who call Southern California home. The LA District Office and the Veteran Business Outreach Center strives to outreach to California's military installations and veteran communities by presenting the Boots to Business curriculum at nearby bases, helping them uh, find financing through our lenders Veterans Pledge, and also teaming up with veteran organizations in our service territory to co-host veteran business events and forums. Thank you again for joining our 2003 Summer Speaker Series. I look forward to meeting here again next summer. Same time, same channel. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Are we staying on or are we through?